Now on KGW News, Oregon lawmakers consider letting felons vote from prison. It's kind of the heights of, uh, of ludicrousness, frankly. There's nothing rehabilitative about being cut off from society. The Oregon Health Authority pulls an ad that was supposed to encourage social distancing. New world, gentlemen. Groups are limited to six. But some say it reminds them of their worst nightmare. Plus, President Biden revokes Portland's status as an anarchist jurisdiction. It's great to have you with us on this Wednesday night. I'm Laurel Porter. Thank you so much for joining us. Thousands more vaccine appointments open up tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. After issues have plagued the scheduling website for weeks, Legacy Health is apologizing and making some changes. Pat Doris has the update. When the clock strikes nine Thursday morning, the website for the Portland metro area's biggest mass vaccination site will open up to visitors, but only 3,800 will be allowed in. It's one of the changes Legacy Health is making to keep its website from crashing. So one of the changes that we're looking at making is when the site has 3,800 people on the site, uh, people will actually get a message that says all positions are full and to try again. And unfortunately, that means having to go back through the OHA website. The other change? A 10-minute clock, which is supposed to reserve the appointment you click on until that time is up, and then you're out. It means tens of thousands of seniors will be kept out of the site and frustrated, just like they were Monday when 70-year-olds became eligible. Legacy spokesman Brian Terrett said the scheduling website was adapted for vaccine appointments in four weeks because it was not clear how vaccines would be distributed or who would be responsible for it until the last minute. And now there is way more traffic than it can handle. Just listen to these numbers. In the greater Portland area, Legacy estimates there are 230,000 people eligible for shots right now, people who have not gotten their shot yet. And they're all competing for roughly 15,000 appointments each week. Monday, March 1st, even more will join them statewide. 258,000 people 65 and older are scheduled to become eligible. And we're going to continue to face this challenge as we go through the phases, as more and more people become eligible to be vaccinated, and we're not, we don't have the vaccines in our possession to vaccinate them. So are you folks ready to go to the governor and say, hold off on adding this huge new group on Monday? Our role in this process is to put a vaccine in the arm of a patient who has an appointment. Um, we, we are leaving it up to the governor and the Oregon Health Authority to make determination about when the phases start. Pat Doris, KGW News. We're all so anxious to get this vaccine to begin to, I can hug my grandkids and, you know, get back into life again. Laura is one of many local seniors relieved to get a vaccine appointment through a pharmacy. She got hers at Costco, one of several places with a supply of doses now. But we found out there's still a very limited number of slots available with pharmacies as well. Walgreens locations in Oregon got about 8,200 doses this week and said it started vaccinating people today. Appointments opened yesterday, but when we tried, we couldn't find any available within 25 miles of Portland, Vancouver, Salem, or Pendleton. Seniors are facing that challenge on multiple pharmacy websites like Albertsons, Costco, Fred Meyer, and Health Mart. The pharmacies say it will get easier to get an appointment as the supply of vaccine increases. Meantime, in Clark County, health officials say the state isn't giving them their fair share of the vaccine. Clark County is the fifth most populated county in Washington, yet it's one of the least vaccinated counties in the state. To compare, Spokane County has about 27,000 more people, but got around 30,000 more first doses. Dr. Alan Melnick says the health providers can meet the demand if given the supply. And, and we, we got a lot of demand and we've got a small amount of resource. But, you know, one of the things we're asking for is to have that resource, you know, have some more information about how that scarce resource is distributed and have it have it transparent and be a little bit more equitable in terms of how it's uh, allocated around the state. And to our county. The day before the state's top to doctor do. said he is aware of the issue and looking at ways to fix the disparities. New here at 11, should felons be allowed to vote while in prison? That's one of the questions Oregon lawmakers are considering right now. 
As it stands, convicted felons can vote in elections only after serving their sentence. But some say, why wait? Mike Benner breaks down the argument for and against. I don't feel like I'm, I'm contributing to anything. Arnaldo yes, Ruiz, Ruiz spent nearly two decades locked up in Oregon. After serving his time, few things gave Ruiz as much joy as voting. It felt really great to get out and be able to just automatically vote. And so there was something about that just felt like I was being accepted back into my community. Now there's a push to give inmates that sense of belonging while in prison. I think this is just a, a basic matter of, of fairness and democracy. State Senator Sarah Gelser is one of the sponsors of Senate Bill 571. The bill, among other things, gives inmates the right to vote in elections while behind bars. Multnomah County District Attorney Mike Schmidt testified Wednesday in support of the idea. And restoring the right to vote to those who are incarcerated is at its core a gesture of hope. It gives people the right to dream, to participate, and to care. If this bill becomes law, Oregon would not be the first state to allow its inmates the right to vote in prison. Maine already allows it. A person who is incarcerated maintains closer ties to the community to which they will return after incarceration if they're able to continue to have a vote and voice in who represents them. Not everybody should be afforded that voice and vote, according to former Clatsop County District Attorney Joshua Marquis. He says it would be ludicrous to let people who are incarcerated vote for some of the things that show up on ballots. The kinds of decisions that we allow voters to make in this state, to whether we should or should not have a death penalty, whether there should be mandatory sentencing. Those sorts of decisions, Marquis says, do not belong in the hands of inmates. In addition to voting while incarcerated, this bill would also allow inmates to register to vote and update their voter registration while incarcerated. This bill still has a long way to go before becoming law. We'll be sure to follow along. I'm Mike Benner for KGW News. Remember when President Trump threatened to revoke funding from Portland because the city was allowing anarchy? Well, today, President Biden revoked that memo. The Trump administration put the memo out back in September in response to ongoing protests. It ordered federal agencies to review funding to state and local governments that, quote, permitted anarchy, violence and destruction. The memo called out Portland by name. There were never any reports that funding was actually pulled from the city. And President Biden's memo today tells budget offices to reverse any orders or guidelines that would cut funding for that reason. You've probably seen the ads from the Oregon Health Authority during the pandemic. They encourage mask wearing or social distancing. Now the agency has decided to pull one of the ads from the air after some found it quite tone deaf. Dan Haggerty explains. It was supposed to be a relatable ad to encourage social distancing, so they focused on fishermen out at sea. I bet that's about as Oregon as you can get, and it was relatable too relatable. Now, if you haven't seen it, we want to play it for you now. New rule, gentlemen. Groups are limited to six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Thank you, Oregon for limiting gatherings. Okay, now I want to acknowledge right off the bat, some of you might be thinking, what's the big deal? It's a commercial, they made a joke, but let's give it just a little bit of context because four days ago, two fishermen died off the coast when their boat capsized. This is Todd Chase, one of the two fishermen who died over the weekend near the mouth of Tillamook Bay when his ship turned over. A married man for 30 years, he has sons and he's gone now. But, but here's the thing, the deaths this weekend were not an anomaly, far from it actually. In Newport, they have a memorial on the coast for the fishermen who have lost their lives in the water off the coast there over the past century. There are more than a hundred names of people who went overboard and never came back. So when Newport's mayor heard about the ad and saw the ad, he asked the state personally to take it down. Now I'll admit, when I first saw the ad, I didn't have a negative reaction, but I don't live on the coast. I don't have family who work on the water. 
I'm one of the people, admittedly so, that probably take for granted the effort and risk that it takes to put food on my plate. So we're not trying to make anybody feel bad here, not at OHA or with the firm who put this ad together. Instead, we wanted to give you a little context that I found valuable today from the families who do know the risks and the loss all too well. This is a really dangerous industry. It's, it's the most dangerous industry in the world. We lose lives all of the time. So, so when something, um, I guess, that looks funny or, or are trying to make light of a situation for them is actually for us uh, bringing back what we deal with every day and, and our greatest fears. If you want to see the ad again, well, you might have to rewind this newscast because I'm pretty sure it's going to be taken down from anywhere you might see it. OHA has decided to pull it from all platforms.